Welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered. It's my podcast, and man, I'm so thankful that you've joined us. This week, we've got a great show. We're going to review all the short tracking from Martinsville, Virginia. We're going to preview Texas. The boys are heading to the Lone Star State, and they're going to be hauling the mail down there. And Ross Chastain joins us to talk about all of his racing, the ups and downs, and what it's like to be a winner in the Xfinity Series. And we're going to do it all right now. Green play, green play. We went short track racing in Southern Virginia this weekend. We were up at Martinsville on the paperclip, the half mile that is so tough and so challenging. And when that race started, I couldn't wait to see how the drivers attack that track with the 2019 car. And the reason why I say that, people have told me a lot lately that they really don't go off of practice anymore. They think that maybe practice is a good gauge, but they've got to adjust and adapt their setups to go racing on Sunday afternoon. Martin Truex was dominant in the final practice on Saturday afternoon in his Sirius XM number 19 Toyota for Joe Gibbs Racing. But when I talked to him on the grid, he's like, you know, that's great. We want to be fast, but we had to make some adjustments. We had to make some changes. And so there were a lot of unknowns as that race started on Sunday afternoon. But one thing that became clear very quickly, Brad Keselowski and Paul Wolf they had tuned that forward up, and they had it figured out. He quickly went around Joey Logano. His teammate got the lead, led over 440-some laps. And you know what I love about NASCAR? When a guy dominates and wins, do you know what he won by? About a car length. Chase Elliott found something in those last seven, eight laps. He ran high into the corners. He was able to run down Brad, and he really had the heat on him. There was not a lot of crashes. There weren't a lot of cautions. There weren't a lot of lead changes. But if you were at Martinsville, like I was, setting up on the hill watching, there was a lot of action, side by side, beating and banging, racing short track style that I really love seeing. And so I wrote on the old Twitter machine, I hope people don't just say, well, Brad dominated. These new rules, these 2019 cars aren't that fun to watch. Well, you can't even begin to think that the cars had anything to do with the product you saw Sunday. It was just racing. It was just a guy who got on a roll. He got his car right where he wanted it, and he managed that was a, a, a comment he made after the race. He said, I got out front and I was able to manage the race. That's just brilliance. His crew chief, his team, they were brilliant with the adjustments. The pit stops were perfect. And Brad put on a performance like we've seen at Martinsville in the past when Richard Petty won 15 times. My brother Daryl, the success he had there, Jeff Gordon's victories. There's just people that get it and they get the job done. And instead of complaining about what we saw on Sunday, I just want to celebrate it. I think it was crazy amazing to watch Brad operate. And he operated flawlessly for 500 laps. And that included having to close it late when Chase Elliott was running him down. So thank you, Brad. Thank you for that performance. And I just appreciate what you accomplished. <laughs> now it's on to Texas. That's a whole different animal. Texas is going to be a lot like what we've seen at Las Vegas what we saw at California, wide open racing, fast speeds, a lot of throttle down in the corners. It's recently repaved and reconfigured, so I can't wait to see the 2019 cars and how they will run there. Been a lot of talk about qualifying, especially after California when nobody made a lap. Obviously, that was disappointing. So NASCAR made some announcements. They're tweaking not the rules so much from what I can read, but the enforcing of the rules. The rules have been there. And now they're going to make it black and white on how they're going to enforce it. I know that we will see a more uniform qualifying session when we get to Texas. And I can't wait to see how it plays out. And I'm also looking forward to seeing how the racing is going to be at Texas. Because the product we've seen on the mile and a half, so Atlanta, Vegas, what we saw at California, it's just, it's just black and white. There's been, been better racing. And Texas is a place where I expect that to even be the case more so. So I look forward to seeing these boys turn it loose in the Lone Star State. And I really look forward to introducing y'all to Ross Chastain. Ross is the busiest man in NASCAR in 2019. He started more races than Kyle Busch. Can you believe that? And 
He almost won the Truck Series race on Saturday up in Martinsville. Was third down in Daytona. Really, really good season for this young man. And Ross's story is more about overcoming adversity than it is necessarily winning. But he's a winner. He won that big Xfinity race at Las Vegas last fall. But after that, things took a crazy turn. We're going to talk to him about it. Chastain to the lead. Ross Chastain to the front for the first time today. Today, I feel really good about having my buddy, Ross Chastain, joining us for the Waltrip Unfiltered podcast. Ross, thanks for coming by. Yes, sir. Thank you for inviting me, and I accepted even before you knew that you invited me. So, <laughs> Well, what's crazy about that, when I talked to you after your stage win at Martinsville on Saturday, I... Ask you how it felt, and you won. You were awesome. You beat Kyle Busch. That's the first time he's been beat all year at anything, by the way, in the truck series. In the truck, yeah. Yeah, so good job on that. And so I congratulated for you for that. And then we were talking, and I heard you say something about the podcast, but I wasn't sure what you said. And you were saying you'll see me on Monday, right? That's that's what I was trying to say. I, I realize my, uh, my, my accent sometimes doesn't come across on the radio too well. A lot of my crew chiefs have to ask me to repeat things, so... Uh, I tend to mumble, um, so yeah, I, I didn't come across as clear as I meant to. Sorry about that, but oh, yeah, I was okay. I was telling you I would see you here now. Great job, another top five finish. I know you had a little bit of side wagers with some of your buddies saying I'm going to finish in the top five, and they're like, not so quick, Ross. I did, but you pulled it off. And uh, your two finishes in 2019, the third at Daytona and, and fourth yesterday, are the mm-hmm. best finishes for Nice uh, Motorsports, and and you're driving that that truck, and that's nothing surprising to me. You seem to always, no matter what you get into, overachieve. And n- another example of that on Saturday. Well, I'd, and I think a lot of it's been fortunate timing, you know, teams and NASCAR and just like the the real world outside of the, our sport, uh, everything's in a cycle. So the weather's in a cycle, you know, for I get into a whole other tangent, but for the, the worldwide like weather for areas goes in cycles and, and so does race teams. So I, I saw last year that Nice Motorsports was going to be cycling up soon. I didn't know how soon. Uh, I drove their truck, jumped in it in a practice session in Iowa and thought, man, this thing has some potential and then I raced it at Bristol, Texas and Homestead and and we were really far off geometry wise and on our setups um, but I knew that if we could just tie up a few loose ends it was going to be really good and uh, and we've done that now so uh, our first stab at Martinsville um, you know where Kyle and and the Nemco truck and the GMS trucks and Thorsport they've all been running there for years you know some of them I mean I, I feel like I feel like old man Sauter's been running there since they probably <laughs> turned the corners from from cobblestone to concrete. So um, yeah, it's just really cool uh, that our first stab at it, we, we legitimately had a shot to run second, and I tried to go win, and then I finished fourth because I probably burned my stuff up too much. Well, you probably feel good on this uh, Monday afternoon here in Charlotte that you did do that. You, I do. you got to go for it, You right? do. Uh, you don't get those opportunities very often. We were talking at, at lunch, you know, uh, we're pretty good at losing, you and I. And, yeah. And, and it takes... Well, let's a, not share that with our listeners. Well, I'm pretty honest well, about it. I'm, I mean, I'm I, one of the losingest drivers of my time right now. Well, I mean. I'm one of the losingest drivers of my time, <laughs> and I, my time preceded your time. Our time's kind of ended... Uh, my time kind of ended when yours started, it did. and and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, 2011 you showed up and, and ran some truck races yeah. and uh, finished second in in Brad's trucks when you got mm-hmm. to drive for him. But overall, I mean the 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 struggle, the the fight. I mean that's what you've been all about since you showed up. And I was sort of the same way. I felt like you know I was pretty blessed. I had a last name. I didn't have any money, but I had a last name, and it got me in some cars, and I was able to do just good enough to hang in there, and I've showed signs of brilliance, and it's it's been a whole lot like that with you. you you've you shown the ability to do the job, but forever, and basically until 2018, we didn't see how good you were. Talk about, you talked about the losing, talk about how important that was and is for you as a as a racer, as a person to be able to face adversity, fight, persevere through all that, and then win. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I would not have written it the way it all has went down up to this point. I wouldn't wish my life on anybody in a good or a bad way. Um, just the ups and downs, uh, you know it, and, and any race car driver knows it. People on the outside might think we have a glamorous life and we live a, a, a good life, but we take this so serious, and that's our own downfall, but it's also the reason that we – strive to win so much that's why winning is so important 
um, because it's everything to us and it's, it's without it, you know, what, what are we doing? So, um, you know, to get the opportunity last year with, with Chip Ganassi racing and, and their Xfinity car for a couple of races and, um, you know, that, that really, no matter what else happens in my life, that changed my life because I won in NASCAR's top divisions, uh, their second division, uh, with the Xfinity series. So, I can always say that. I mean, I once I got to NASCAR, you mentioned the the races in 2011. After I got done with those five races, I thought, well, I, one, I will never win, and I might not ever race again in NASCAR, but I know that I at least did it, and even though got I'll never chance. win, it's okay. Um, so I set my my goals, you know, pretty uh, – I mean, they were still lofty to be competitive, but I just thought – I knew right after those races, I was like, man, what it takes to win is, is beyond where I'll ever reach. So um, to have that opportunity and to – to, to out of the three, you know, had a shot to win all of them, and and definitely capitalize on one. Um, and and just I, I look back at all of them, and I couldn't have done um, a whole lot different speed wise. I could have just raced a little better um, in in the other two races besides the one that we won. Yeah, but man, it was impressive. I mean, you got to go. We just talked about it. Yeah. About Martin. That was last weekend. This past weekend, you said I went for it, and that's what you did when you yeah. got your opportunity with Chip and and got to Victory Lane. Yeah, yeah. That's um, that's something that I'll never uh, back down from is driving aggressively. And and guys, race car drivers that I race against tend to be upset with me, but I bring my friends to the racetrack with me, and and I feel like I'm in a good place um, spiritually and how I approach things and how I go about life, and and I'm working to be better at all that. But I, I still, I, I don't, I don't apologize for anything. I mean, um, I, I'm out riding bicycles with with Moffitt, you know, two weeks ago, and then on track we're running into each other. Um, it's a little misunderstanding there, but uh, you know, we don't, we, we're good enough that we're not going to crash each other, and we're good enough that um, we were both, you know, trying to get up there and fight Kyle for the win. So, uh, clean air, even at Martinsville, is so huge. Um, you know, it's uh, it's important to be in front of as many trucks as you can be. Well, we talked about Martinsville. This weekend in Texas, you're going to make your 250th start in the top three series of NASCAR. We just had lunch, and we were yeah. talking about, I asked you how many starts you had. I don't know. You know, I've had more than 200. So this weekend is 250. That's a milestone start for you. How does it feel being a kid, basically, and, and starting your two, – you're the busiest man in NASCAR. You've run every race this year. Yes. And I think Sunday was your first DNF, right? It was. Wow. It was. Yep. So how does that feel to have all that under your belt and all you've been through, and now you're uh, getting ready to make that big start? Yeah, well, I, I just – I feel like I had to push and, and against some advice of people that I really respect and that I really, really – um, go by their word, like their their word is is the book um, for me, and and I just felt like that I needed to be on track as much as I could because there's still even when I was in the 42, there's so many things I could have done better every lap, whether it's practice qualifying or the race, whether it's feedback to the team, whether it's just you know just feeling things in the car and trying to get everything out of the car that I can, whether it's one lap or or a 40 lap run uh, at Darlington, you know where it, where it tires wear out. Um, just trying to be the best race car driver I can be. I felt like with this year's cup package, trucks would be more important um, than they ever have been to a a cup car. So I just had to really push. Um, Obviously, I feel like it has paid off. Um, You know, we're second in owner points in the truck series and would, if I would have claimed driver points, would be leading the driver points. And that's a tough one to swallow for everybody at Nice, but it's really like they get kind of down about it. I'm like, look how good that is. That means that <laughs> we've ran better than everybody, right. um, you know, and, and we're knocking on the door of winning. And to get Al Nice, uh, the only veteran owner in the in NASCAR, uh, and, and Miss Lou, their first win in the Truck Series would mean, I mean, obviously it's what everybody is striving for, but it would mean the world to me um, to to give that to him for all of his sacrifices, one for our country. Um, and, and now to NASCAR, what he's put in. I mean, it takes it takes a lot to be a team owner in NASCAR. I'm not telling that to anybody new here, but um, it's a tough business model, and, and it's um, I just want to give that to him so bad, and I, and, and I want to win as well. So, um, yeah, the, I didn't know 250. That's a that's a cool deal. Um, and I'll actually run some laps on Thursday with an adaptive car program. I heard uh, about that for some uh, for some wounded veterans and some some guys um, paraplegics and different different uh, scenarios there. So um, excited! I'm going to go up and see the car today for the first time and get out there Thursday and take them around the racetrack. That's so that's got to be that, a thrill for them for sure, but for you to as well to be able to give them that that privilege. It is. 
Yeah, that's really awesome. So you talked about Mr. Nice, uh, Johnny Davis, uh, Jay Robinson. I mean, you're, you've got some guys that own the vehicles you're blessed to be able to race with their sleeves rolled up. They're, they're fighting tooth and nail to, to, to provide you with the equipment that you can go out there and contend and compete with. And the, I know how special that top 10 finish in the Daytona 500 for, for Jay was and yes. for you as well. That's a big deal. It was. I have um, always heard about your time with Jay and, and y'all's run there. Uh, and I remember watching that. And, and obviously as – a race car driver you you study a lot uh and guys talk about watching film but i i feel like i do a pretty good job with and every, every race car driver is pretty arrogant and self-confident in the fact that they do everything better than everybody so i'm very self-aware of that but um, i just remember watching all that and watching you go through the whole weekend with a lot of pressure um for your final race and then you go out and you you accomplish a goal like that um i go into my first my first day total 500 and I had no goals. I thought, man, we'll probably just crash. You know, we'll just, everything will go wrong. Just, I'm a little bit of glass half empty a lot of times. And, and Jay said, no, we stick to the plan. Um, there was offers uh, as, as most, as recent as like Wednesday uh, of the Daytona 500 to, for somebody else to get in the car after we had qualified. And Jay said, nope, sticking to our guns. I know we will make the budget back. We'll make the budget work if we go and run our race and finish where we know we'll finish. And I don't know if he thought 10th. Right. But um, that was a really, really big deal, something that I may never accomplish again, but it's um, the hard work that, you know, you know, there's so many, there's hundreds of people that have gotten to me where I'm at, whether it's small-time sponsors at my local short track or my, my family getting me um, all the breaks or just the, the fact that I grew up on a farm and, and grew up different than everybody else now that I, I know up here in NASCAR world. Um, you know, I feel like I'm pretty different than a lot of them. I might look the same. We're all you know, same, similar kind of guys. Um, but it's, uh, it's really a, a, a dream come true that I can, I'm having a amount of success that I am. Like I walked out of Martinsville yesterday smiling, even though we lost an axle, broke a motor, went a bunch of laps down, um, and didn't win the truck race. I walked out of there smiling out cause I felt like I did a really good job on track. And that you did. And I want to, I want to circle back to the business of NASCAR and oh boy. the fact that you knew the budget and knew what you had to work with when you ran your first Daytona 500 and how big of a success 10th place was. Mm -hmm. I think that's something you can really be proud of. And I know that the, the viewers, a lot of times, they think it's all about winning. Well, it is. But for some teams, you're just trying to make ends meet yes. and, and overachieve. And, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. But, but you touched on something that I want to go in a different direction with your family. You're from Florida. Your 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 family's in watermelons, and and that helped you get started racing, and it, it helped me get to know you back in 2011 when we went somewhere in Delaware or Maryland That's right. and and picked watermelons. That's right. And I, I was so intrigued, or you know, I was a kid. It was I grew up. My daddy was a Pepsi man, and I worked at the Pepsi plant, and and I always appreciated the fact that your daddy was a watermelon farmer and a racer, mm -hmm. and you grew up on a farm. Yep. And picking watermelons. You've seen every bit of that business, haven't you? I have, yes. Um, and they're still going strong. My brother, uh, Chad, is 20 now and working full-time with my dad. And, and uh, you know, just they're down there kicking butt. And it's so cool to uh, to get to go back there, you know, obviously whenever Christmas time. I, I got to go down there this year, and it was a, a little bit of a dark time for me, you know, with everything that had went on. Um, you know, but it's really neat. Um you know, to just see the success uh, that, that my family is able to have. Uh, you know, they before I was ever around, born, uh, they grew, my family's grown uh, every kind of vegetable in South Florida. They were in South Georgia three generations ago, growing tobacco and cotton and, and struggling. You know, it wasn't a great life at all um, from what my, my grandparents tell me. And um, now to see, you know, that we've stuck with it and we found watermelons to be our niche and we don't try to do anything else now. We just try to grow the best watermelons but what's really cool is that just like nascar the watermelon industry is a huge family and even though we're all competitors we all get together for conventions every year and we all have good fellowship and we all a lot of business gets done there and we can work together and trade loads and raise money for charity raise money for research and raise money for marketing for my racing you know as part of the marketing budget um, that's how it all got started yeah and then you remember the queens we still have watermelon queens coming so that's where yes. they come from they have a pageant 
and um, we we pick a new queen each year. They go through a pageant process, and, and they have to be able to be very good at public speaking, something that I have struggled with, and they have taught me some stuff. I mean, a, a watermelon they, queen and a NASCAR driver have to speak a little different. But they um, come to the racetrack with melons and, and pass them out. And they do, and that's the way we, we just try to get, you know, push watermelons to people so that when then they're like, man, that was one good slice. Let me buy one on the way home yes. for the family. And and. It's been about farming since you were a kid, and your did your grandpa was he the one that started in the racing? How did you how did this all begin? There's some mixed stories on Wikipedia. So I, my grandfather never raced. Well, my, that's my, on Wikipedia. Yeah, my and dad I did, did a little research. I know, and and I've taken it down, and I've also never done figure eight boat racing, which is the funniest thing to me because unfortunately Rick Allen had done the same research and on the winning call at Las Vegas last year he he's a figure eight boat, boat racer, racer and now he's a NASCAR winner and that wasn't true I so, just always wanted to do that yeah so so when was the first time how did it all yeah start? yeah so my dad did some he went and rented a fast truck and he um Bobby Deal had this program uh, Bobby Deal I remember that name do you really yeah. wow yeah he's uh he's still around he's gonna come to a race this year we're gonna get him nice. out one he's uh it's been a little while but um, so him, my dad, and a buddy of his, and my uncle, they all rented them, and my dad drove it around the packing house and uh, in our farm, and he said, okay, you know, I want to go to the track. So they go to the track, and Bobby uh, is there helping him, and he says, Ralph, you got to pull your belts tight. Anyway, Bobby pulls my dad's belts tight, seat belts, and he can't reach the pedals now. Like, they never pulled the belts <laughs> tight in the shop, uh, in the barn. They didn't have a race shop then. How old so, was your dad at this point? Um, 30. Yeah. Just did some hobby stuff. So he did that, traveled around a few races, open trailer, just had fun, and then uh, sold his truck. Um, and then my dad's friend, Dennis Rockin' House, kept his, parked it out back behind the house, let it sit. And um, so when I turned 12, my dad asked me if I wanted to go to the track. We went and watched Matt Martin, Mark's son, race. And right. he was in the Fast Kid program. He won the race. They threw Gatorade on him. It was the coolest thing. And I was like, I want to be like Matt. And so we went and got Dennis's truck and got it out and raced a little bit. Um, my grandparents got involved because they wanted to help and keep me safe. My grandfather is a mechanic. And then, um, man, it really brought our family together. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we realized maybe, um, you know, how, how close, how much closer we could be than we already were um, by going to the racetrack and everybody coming over and helping on the race car. It really brought us all together. And, and um, we just did it as a hobby, though. Got into some uh, limited late model stuff. Um, at New Smyrna won the World Series, and that's when my dad said, okay, we need to, we want to look, do we want to look at NASCAR? And that was the question on the front stretch after we won the World Series down there. Um, and, and I said, I mean, yeah, we, let's, what does it take? I have no idea. And so we figured out the business side of it and um, met Stacy Compton. And from there, um, for one reason or another, it's all worked out. We've been inc incredibly blessed and very lucky. You've had some, some great rides and some great owners. And in 2018... I would guess, and I'm going to ask you, when Chip Ganassi asked you to drive the 42 car, was that a dream come true? Yes. That's that's what I would assume it was. And when you got that opportunity, you were so impressive behind the wheel, nearly won at Darlington, dominated there, and then took that car to Victory Lane in Las Vegas. Tell me who you were that Saturday night after you, you accomplished that in Las Vegas and, and what what your emotions were and, and how you thought back to, to your dad and your grandpa and everybody making you a safer car. And now you're a winner in one of the top series of NASCAR. Yeah, it's, it's incredible as I try to think back on it. Some of it's blurry. Uh, it was a lot to take in. I had the cup race the next day with premium, so I didn't get, I didn't get crazy. Yeah, um, but, but, but it was it, Vegas. I don't it know. It was, but I, I, uh, we, we got done with victory lane. I stayed in there as long as I could. We went and took <laughs> some pictures for, um, the playoffs for Xfinity mm -hmm. uh, with all the other drivers. So I was late to that because I came straight from Victory Lane. Um, stopped on the way back from there to walk back to Victory Lane because I didn't want to be done yet and slipped into a little side room next to the media center and uh, had a moment to myself because it all of a sudden kind of hit me. Um, didn't, you know, it, it the, 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 once the cameras were away and all the people, I was kind of, I kind of caught a second to myself. Um, and then went back there to Victory Lane for a minute, just stood around with my mom and dad, some family friends, the Foxes were there. They haven't came to a race in five years and they pick one, they pick Vegas. And of course we win. So it was great to see them there. Um, I grew up racing against Patrick, their son, and, uh, we used to beat and bang fenders every weekend in the fast kids series. So that was cool. Um, and, and then, my parents were there, uh, but no one else was there. So it was kind of 
a lot of them came to Darlington being they could drive up from Florida, mm-hmm. but trip out to Vegas was a little far. So um, then a lot of them came to Richmond. So it was kind of like, oh, man. But still, we wouldn't trade it for the world. And, uh, yeah, just a lot of uh, – my dad comes as many as he can. He was there. Y'all showed him on the broadcast spinning around on the hauler. Yes. Um, he claims he only did that while we were leading, so he said he didn't have well, to do it Well, you could tell his intensity long. level up there was really high yes. when you were leading that race. Yeah, so it's um, – you know, we never – we just never thought any of this was, was going to happen. We never thought we'd have much success. You know, I mean, just realistically, NASCAR is the best of the best, you know, that good race car drivers but do the best Monday to Thursday to get on track on a NASCAR circuit in a NASCAR race car. So um, you have to have the whole package, you know. I mean, there's – I know that there's tens of thousands of race car drivers in, in the world, and, and a lot of them are probably better than me and a lot of, better than us. And, and you just have to just wade through all the stuff um, to get there and then just be the best you can be once you do arrive. And you were – on that afternoon in September in Las Vegas. There's and still room for improvement, though. But I, but that gave you the opportunity to put Johnny Davis in the playoffs. It gave you the opportunity to, to race for a championship. But then it was announced that you you were, you were going to drive that 42 full-time in 2019. I talked about the dream come true of winning. <laughs> it just keeps getting better and better, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was um, a lot of talks then about the championship last year and how do we go about – you know, we had um, we had a, a opportunity to run Dover and didn't want to do that because that was a really big race for Johnny uh, and everybody at JDM with our Use Your Melon campaign up there, and we're doing that again in the on the four car. This and coming this April. Co- yeah, and yeah, cool. The spring and fall Dover races. We'll do Protect Your Melon in the spring for right. buckling up, and Use Your Melon in the fall for driving sober. That's awesome. So it's really. Um, I was actually just going through some emails before I came in here. We're doing some more video stuff, video oriented shoots to uh, have out for social because we're kind of. Delaware is a small state, but we have a very large presence up there. Actually, a lot of the residents up there think I live there because mm-hmm. I'm up there for their state fair and the races, and we're up there a week each time. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, – we didn't do the Dover race, and then we had – we'd had talks about running races in the rounds, getting to Homestead, and then having Homestead. But, um, you know, John Hunter was in there. We wanted him to, to run out, to you know, try to go win the owner's championship. He was – he had been – had more races with the team, probably a little more well-versed. He goes and wins Kansas. Great um, you know, obviously great for him. That was, uh, I was one of the first ones I, I about jumped in the window. Uh, <laughs> I knew how hard he'd been working. We were right. working side by side and we still do. Um, so I still have some, uh, you know, work with, with Josh over there, Josh Wise and, and John Hunter and Kyle and different people. Um, just trying to be the best race car driver we can all be. That's what we're all trying to do. So, um, I was probably, I actually probably initially was more excited when he won because when I won, it was kind of like, oh, my God, no, I don't even believe it. Like, I really didn't. I, I And I don't think a lot of people saw it coming. I mean, I did. Right. I've been your buddy forever, and I knew you had the talent, right. and it wasn't a surprise to me at all. Yeah. Well, you gave a pretty good insight to who you were at Darlington. So, Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. That was fun to watch. I know it got a little bit weird at the end. But let me fast forward. Everything from the win at – Vegas, uh, everything, we're getting a full-time ride, we're racing for a championship, everything is perfect, and it's Christmas time, it's time to be thankful and happy, and Ross is looking at 2019 and saying, I'm going to win me a championship, and the call came, Yep. and that had to just set you back tremendously. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I don't know how you're supposed to handle something like that, um, it, it didn't sink in, uh, I called my my dad uh and uncle and and people my family in florida and told them the next day and you know how do you no one knew what to say i didn't either uh, what, I mean, what did when when the news came that dc solar was was out and there was issues and chip wasn't going to be able to race forward uh, how does how I'm, I'm sure it broke chip's heart too to call you and tell you that what what was that call like just sorry bud yeah there was nothing needed to be said we both knew the situation um and we just said we'll figure it out one day. And, and I told him I'd be there when he was ready. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stop. I, I said that then I went home for Christmas, was home for about a week and, and thought a lot about walking away from all this and just maybe, maybe it's just not meant to be. Maybe, maybe it's not in my plan to do this and, and just felt like 
there was more to be gained here and more that I was supposed to do in NASCAR. So the farm will be there. Um, obviously, when I go back, I'll be low man on the totem pole, and I'm <laughs> kind of excited about that. Yeah, you work know? your way back up. Yeah, huh? less responsibilities uh, right off the bat. I'll just have everybody, they'll, when they need to delegate something, my brother, um, he'll just tell me what to do. And that's when I'm there, That's he tells me go do this, I go do it. And um, That's awesome. So, yeah, so just thought a lot about that and, and re- thought, you know, I want to make a go at this. I feel like there's potential. Uh, I see light. I don't see the doom and gloom people. People talk about with the ratings and the attendance. I just I see a lot of good in yeah. NASCAR, and it was I, all I, evident at Martinsville this past weekend. Yes, how much energy was up there? Right, a lot and of fun. People are always going to find something to complain about. No doubt, especially you know? now that they have that Twitter that thing. That darn Twitter. Yeah, I wish I don't yeah. know. I like it, but I, I'm with you. I don't know. Oh, we're the same. So you get on the phone, you call Johnny, yeah. you call. Well, you he call. called me. So once they told him, um, he called me right away and said, you know. Do you want to get back in the four? Um, so the Blake deal, you know, he had been announced. It was terrible timing. Um, his deal ended up not working out. So um, the four car was back open. You know, we looked at the 15 number um, to, to line it up with Jay and premium. And at the time, Jay had the 15 in truck as well. Uh, rights, he had the That's rights to the number. number. Yeah, it is. I love that number. So, um, but we wanted to stick with the four. We had so much history and so much, um, you know, good luck with the four that mm-hmm. obviously hasn't went great this year uh, so far in the four car, but we're we're going to get it back to where we were last year. And, um, yeah, so he called me. Yep, we'll do that. Um, the colleague stuff was working with Nutrient Ag Solutions. So Elliot Sadler um, had, that, uh, had that sponsorship and had that program, and he wanted me to be a part of it. Nice. And that is so cool. Yeah. That somebody um, he he tells me the story about Dale Jarrett helping him, um, and he wanted to help somebody now that he's stepping back from racing and he wants to be at more of his kids' uh, events and, and games. So, um, man, Brett Griffin and, and the the group that they have has been great. They've added Talladega now, mm-hmm. um, you know. So we've got Chicago in the fall, Texas, and Talladega coming up. And just working with Nutrient Ag Solutions is going to be a big step in my career. Uh, we don't know how it's totally going to be written yet as far as, you know, if we look back in 10 years, but a lot of potential there and a lot of uh, of just good people and farmers and farming and everybody in the ag community, is that's what I'm all about and that's what Nutrient Ag Solutions is all about. So being able to, you know, we were talking at lunch about public speaking and stuff. I, I've struggled a little bit with that, but I can talk to a farmer <laughs> about his seed and the germ rate and what's going on, and I can talk to and him. I would struggle there. Yeah, so that's my wheelhouse. So if I can marry, which marry, I don't like to use that word. Well, it's not out. time yet. You don't, no. So I if don't I really can, like to talk about it either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can bring together uh, racing and agriculture, that's my dream situation. Um, you know, So having them on board is, is a dream come true. Well, having you here today is something that is really uh, I'm thankful for because it it sends a message that there's going to be twists and there's going to be turns. Man. And when you think you've got it all figured out, you better figure again. I know you're very well aware that I lost a whole lot of races before I finally won one, but I'd never quit believing and I never ever considered giving up. And and I know there's times when you look in the mirror and you say, what am I doing? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? But inside, the answer is, yes, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and I just appreciate you sharing your story with, the, with everybody today and, and coming to 2019 with a different plan than you thought you were going to have, but then maximizing the way you've run in the trucks and, and your Daytona 500 and Johnny Davis's cars. This, this, this year, I hate to sound corny, but the way it's going, it could – be more valuable than if it had to win in any other way i that's all i can believe in that everything happens for a reason and, and you have to lose something to gain something great and, and i believe in in uh, in his will and um you know whatever i'll be here for the for the good stuff whenever it comes i mean this is great times now uh you know we're, we're everything is has went really well on, on each side in certain areas um and we're just trying to clean up the, the small mistakes you know now on the racing side uh, but for me as a person, um, got to go home um, a couple weeks ago and see some of my family. Some of my grandparents are going through some stuff, uh, some surgeries, just um, fighting the fighting the fight with uh, you know some scary stuff. But um, you know to to see them and spend some time with them was great. 
and um, I'm getting to chase my dream here in, in Mooresville and um, try to be a successful NASCAR driver, which is uh, is insane for me to think about. <laughs> well, uh, have a great time in Texas. Thanks for what you're doing for the, the paralyzed and the, the, the car that you're going to drive down there. And you're going to pass 250 starts. Make sure, uh, make sure you look around and think how blessed you are, and I know you will. And thank you for coming to, to see me at Walter Fun Filtered. Well, thanks for having me. Man, that was some deep stuff, huh? You just never know what's around the next turn. That's why you got to roll up your sleeves and keep fighting. Thank you, Ross, so much for joining us today. And thank you for clicking on your favorite podcast app and subscribing to Waltrip Unfiltered. Be sure to give us a rating. We want five stars. And we're going to keep bringing you quality content like you heard here today. Next week, we're going to review Texas fast speeds on the mile and a half down in the Lone Star State, and then we'll turn our focus to another short track race. We're going to go to Richmond, Virginia for short track racing like it's supposed to be. I can't wait. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week.